Welcome to Climate Change The Facts 2020 interview series brought to you by the Institute of Public Affairs, Australia's leading voice for freedom and hosted by me, Joe Nova. Climate Change The Facts 2020 is the fourth edition in the Institute of Public Affairs Climate Change The Facts series. You can purchase a copy of this hugely popular book online at climatechangethefacts.org.au. So I'm here with Jennifer Marahasi today, the editor, editor of this, and, and boy, do I know how much work it took for Jennifer to put this together. It's years to uh, collect together all of these chapters, and we're going to discuss this great new volume. So welcome, Jennifer. Thanks, Jo. So, Jen, I'm still reading through many of these chapters, and there's so much to discuss, and of course, we, this book was about Antarctica. So tell me, why Antarctica? Why that thing? So there's sort of three sections to the book. Antarctica's one of them. And I guess because a lot of the people that have contributed to this book are independent thinkers and they're not coming from a sort of consensus perspective, um, it's good to have a theme and give them an opportunity to explore that. So we decided let's focus a little bit in on Antarctica, um, not just temperature, but of course there's volcanoes at Antarctica, there's penguins at Antarctica. So I found somebody to write uh, with authority about penguins. I found a volcanologist to write about volcanoes at Antarctica. And then of course there's this issue of temperature. And while there's been a lot of interest in the media about increasing temperatures at the Arctic, what people haven't much focused on is the extent to which there's actually been cooling at Antarctica. And that's in the satellite record, as Roy Spencer explains in his chapter. It's also in the thermometer record that starts in about 1947, as Ken Stewart explains in his chapter. And it's also in the proxy record, as John Abbott and I explain in, uh, in, in our chapter on Antarctica. So they're, they're just, there's actually four chapters in the book that all look at temperatures at Antarctica, but from a different perspective. Mm. And those chapters were all developed independently of each other, but they all come to the same conclusion, that we actually have an overall trend of cooling at Antarctica and over different time spans. So well, and It's a fascinating continent. I'm really glad that you focused in on it because, as you said, there's a lot in this debate which is about the Arctic. There's a lot of specialists, I guess, who live close to the Arctic, so there's plenty of sceptics and uh, other establishment scientists we can talk about with the Arctic, but with the Antarctic, there's been not much debate. And yet it's been a poster child for the global warming, all of those shots of giant glaciers carving in Antarctica, the threat that it'll melt. We're talking about a, a continent which is twice the size of Australia. It's 14 million square kilometres. It's enormous, and yet it's got... Um, the three kilometre layer thick of ice on top of it, most of it. And I, I don't know if people are aware, but the West Antarctic wing is the smaller part in the peninsula that sort of leans up towards Argentina. And that's the part where there has been some warming. But the bulk of Antarctica, the majority of it, which is this enormous slab of three kilometre thick ice, that's the part which, you know, if that melted, of course, that would be devastating but it's minus 50 degrees or so, isn't it? I mean, the odds of, of it caring less about a two degree warming is nothing. And that is another key point, polar amplification. That was one of the main points about Antarctica, wasn't it? The idea that the poles would warm twice as much as the, um, the, the tropical zone. That's, that's that built was, in. That was, um, that was what was claimed and that was sort of central for a long time to... Um, catastrophic human-caused anthropogenic global warming theory was the idea that, that both the North and the South Pole would warm more than anywhere else. What we've got, and it's very clear from, say, the figures, because while there's been a focus in the book on Antarctica, we did end up including information about um, the Arctic. And, for example, Howard Brady's Chapter 2 shows the extent of sea ice at the Antarctic 
versus the Arctic. And they've actually responded, the extent of the sea ice and the long-term trends are quite different in those two polar areas. And regional variability, um, it's something that I guess is not discussed enough um no yeah. i agree with you and 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 just the poles are so opposite in more than the obvious way being that the arctic is just a block of ice floating on water and it comes and goes and has always come and gone and in the southern pole we've got this huge continent covered with a massive layer of ice and it has its own circumpolar current uh, a, a major ocean current it is so it's they're, they're very different these two things and their temperature trends are opposite often yeah and I, yeah, I know. I think Svensmark had theories about that, which I thought were very interesting. The idea, the whiteness of Antarctica is so white; it's even whiter than clouds, which changes the reflectivity. So the Antarctic can behave oppositely to the Arctic because of that change in reflectivity, because it, its ice is just so white on the South Pole. And I think on the North Pole, we've got problems with soot from shipping traffic has been partly responsible for melting some of that ice in the Arctic. Okay. So we don't, we, with respect to the Arctic, we really mostly just talk about polar bears mm -hmm. and how even though we've got a decreasing trend of sea ice in the Arctic um, with levels now perhaps as low as they were going back to the 1930s, nevertheless, we've had increasing numbers of polar bears. And Susan Crockford um, provides some data on that in chapter one. That's the opening chapter for the book. I'm looking forward to talking to Susan so to soon. Um, and of course, I wrote a chapter on Antarctica. And this was one of the core reasons that got me into the debate was the ice cores. So um, I was glad, although daunted, when you asked me to look at the Antarctic ice cores because they are, I mean, these are the bubbles in ice, supposedly marketed as the ancient bubbles from 200, 500,000 years ago containing the atmosphere. And yet that's a myth, the way they've marketed that to pretend it's like a tiny snapshot of time. So it was fascinating. Fascinating to read through this. So Although, just, um, just exhausting for, for people listening, because you're such an expert on this. And I think if people go to your chapter, which is chapter five, and they look at page 83, there's figure 5.2. And, you know, going back, you really put some time into sort of sorting out whether temperature actually does move lockstep with carbon dioxide or whether in fact it may precede it. And I, I love the way you begin this chapter explaining that, that the core information was sort of buried in the policymaker summary. Did you it, want to... Yes. I mean, and this was so important to me too. When um, my other half, David, who worked for the Greenhouse Office, came to me and he says, you know, there's no evidence, I argued against him. This is a Tuesday afternoon in February 2007 and I said, are you kidding? Of course, there's the ice cores. And this is the graph that uh, Al Gore showed or he showed the longer extended version of that graph. The one you're looking at now is the, uh, the, the graph from the 1990, the first IPCC report. And at that stage, they had 160,000 years of ice core data. And it had shocked the world. It had come out in the 1980s and it had shown this lockstep pattern, temperature and CO2 both going up and down and up and down. You can't look at that graph and not think, wow, something's going on. It's not an accident. So people two look at the chart and they think carbon dioxide's actually forcing temperature change. But you went into the chart with so much more detail and actually showed that when you look in detail, it's the other way around, isn't and, it? And this is the extraordinary story. So this was put forward in late 80s and 90s and saying, this is it, the proof that CO2 is. But if you read what they said in 1990, there was a catchphrase, a caveat in there. And it said, well, we're not sure of cause and effect, meaning code for, we're not sure whether temperature is driving CO2 or CO2 is driving temperature. I thought I was being told the whole story, but papers started coming out. They got better resolution on the ice cores in the late 1990s. And that's when they did figure out cause and effect. And so from 1999 to 2003, five papers came out and probably a lot more. And they all said 
well, actually, there's a lag and CO2 is rising first. Uh, sorry, temperature is rising first. And CO2 is following temperature in every case, in every turning point. And they estimated the lag at somewhere between 200 and 1,000 years. I think by 2003, Calion et al. said it will, it's about 800-year lag. Because the ice core data suggests, well, if you don't look at it at too fine a resolution, it can be interpreted to suggest that carbon dioxide is really important. And everybody talks all the time about the importance of carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. And I was just thinking... Jeff Duffy's chapter 11 has got some nice charts in it and it really does put carbon dioxide a little bit in its perspective as well. Like he, he shows that relative to, for example, water vapour, carbon dioxide's not actually a big absorber of either incoming solar radiation uh, in figure 11.3 or relative to water vapour, carbon dioxide's not a big uh, observer of the re-emitted th thermal radiation. So if you're talking about greenhouse gases, and I, I think the point was made in, in a chapter in the last series of, of, of this book, but also in chapter 11 of this book, that if you're talking about greenhouse gases, you know, water vapour is so important relative to carbon dioxide by um, volume of the atmosphere, by extent to which... Um, it absorbs uh, energy and uh, and, well, and, and energy. Yes, and 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 Jen and flipping between who's playing interviewer in this interview. Yes, exactly. The um the the, the water vapor was one of the key points I put forward in the skeptics handbook because the missing hotspot and water vapor is so crucial to this debate. So I'm really glad that you've got chapters and that graph, the atmospheric spectrum. People need to know that that how broad the water vapor spectrum is, how many different wavelengths it absorbs on, and the fact that you know we, we talk about CO two being four hundred parts per million, but water vapor because of humidity ranges from ten thousand parts per million to forty thousand parts per million. I mean, it dwarfs everything CO two does. It comes and it goes. It's there one day and it's gone the next. Oh, we are the water planet. The idea that water isn't the major controlling force of our climate is just ridiculous. And so, yes, it's great to see chapters like the Duffy one with those graphs in and talking about this role of water because what water does, and it's such a wonderful molecule, it's the only one which forms a layer of ice where the solid of the, of the molecule is less dense than the liquid. Imagine if ice formed on the bottom of our lakes and rivers and on the bottom, if it didn't float, you wouldn't get sea ice, you, you, fish couldn't survive underwater through winters. It, a whole lot of things would change. But the fact that water shifts through all its states and they're all important, including when it's clouds, when it's water vapour, when it's in liquid. So we've got every different state of water virtually and they all have a different impact. And this is what the models are so struggling to capture aren't they and and I, I guess I was really keen to include Jeff Duffy's chapter because when the IPA was talking about this book and yes we did say okay let's sort of focus in on one region which was Antarctica but I really wanted this book to also be moving the discussion forward in terms of let's move you know, we've been talking at the IPA and also I've been talking with Peter Ridd for some time about how in actual fact, we know that catastrophic anthropogenic climate change is a failed paradigm, but how do we move beyond that? Because the history of science would suggest that you don't actually ever disprove a theory until you replace it. And then everybody goes, yeah, yeah, we knew it was wrong, but you mm. often have to have something to replace it um, before you can get that acceptance. So I've been talking with Peter Reard and Scott Hargraves at the IPA for some time about the need for us to start publishing um, people who are thinking about new um, theories of climate change. And of course, central to that is Henrik Svensmark and Richard Lindzen's seminal paper back in 2001 um, was so important in terms of, I think, disproving the hardcore of of uh, anthropogenic carbon dioxide-driven global warming theory. 
I think you're absolutely right, Jen. I'm just going to jump in there and say, isn't it an interesting social kind of statement that a group which is a free market institute is doing the cutting edge and publishing the cutting edge new theories rather than the standard establishment scientific groups, which is what we expect. I mean, the ARC has a budget, Australian Research Council has a budget of $800 million a year, and yet we're not getting this work from the CSIRO. It's not coming from ANU or Sydney Uni. All of our academic institutes are largely absent from anything which steps outside the paradigm. And I just th- I think it's a really interesting statement and comment that we're getting uh, great conferences and papers. They're coming, they're leaking out, they're, they're sort of breaking through from other areas and other groups. And it's, it's a very brave and excellent of the IPA to be stepping into this debate. I mean, there's a vacuum and I think, you know, good ideas will find a way to get out, but it, it's so brilliant to get some help for them. If I can pick up on your point, why would a th- free market think tank be interested in climate. And I think one of the problems is the ARC and government sees climate as this political tool for instilling fear. And you've written so much about that and Mm. explained it. So climate becomes this um, moral issue and it's about um, catastrophic change and it's about people doing the wrong thing when in actual fact... um, for for any um, well, climate is so important in terms of not just being able to forecast droughts and floods and bushfires, but civilizations that um, can accurately forecast weather and climate um, have military advantage. It's actually mm-hmm. a national security issue, and the fact that. Uh, it's been taken over, climate research in Australia and around the Western world has essentially been taken over by ideologues rather than people who have an economic interest uh, could be our undoing um, as a civilization. And that might sound a little bit um, over the top, but as I explain in the introduction to this book, um, it was the fact that the Allies could some days out forecast a lull in the storm going back to June 1944, gave them the confidence to plan for D-Day. There was a lull in the storm as James Stagg, the British meteorologist, forecast. Eisenhower um, planned for that. He had confidence in his meteorologist's ability to forecast climate. And D-Day was a success, and many say that that was a turning point. Um, So, you know, if we are to have a military advantage, if we are to have successful agriculture, if we are to understand the likely direction and intensity of cyclones, we need to get back to the fundamentals when it comes to climate. Exactly. If we're going to plan for droughts or floods, it would be handy to know when they were coming more than 10 days in advance, and we're not very good at that. Uh, And, and of course, then there's the big thing about weakness. When you're talking about geopolitical strategic weakness, the fact that we are trying to turn our electricity grid into a weather-changing thing more than we are trying to make it an efficient electricity grid. And when you try using your electrical power generators as weather-changing things, it doesn't work out too well for industry or the rest of us paying our electricity bills. And so getting to the core of this climate science is so important. So um, John Abbott's two chapters in this book I think are important from that perspective because When you think about the history of science, and not only do you need uh, often a new theory that people can grasp onto before they'll accept that the old one has been disproven, but often that comes with new tools. So, for example, the telescope was so important for Kepler and Galileo. Mm. And my feeling is that we need to realise that if we are going to move beyond current theories of, of carbon dioxide driven climate change we need new tools and And you're talking about neural nets there i guess as a tool for looking at rainfall so john abbott's chapter 14 um it actually begins not all ideas for a clean energy future is stupid and he actually talks about using hydroelectricity to produce hydrogen as a fuel for aviation 
And to make that a reality, you really need to be able to know if your dams are going to have water mm. and plan releases around that. And so he explains how you can use the latest advances in artificial intelligence, in artificial neural networks to mine historical climate data and, uh, and thus to be able to forecast floods and droughts. And there's so many different things to read in here about that, including with uh, Lynn's and Zyra's theory, which was I found interesting to read about what happened when he put that theory out and how quickly the uh, so-called rebuttals came out and the label controversial happened, uh, was plugged onto everything he said. And I guess his stories of the struggle putting out that paper, and it was about 2000, 2001, wasn't he 2001, the, the paper was published and there was a huge... And, and Lindzen never, when he, that paper was published 20 years ago now, Richard Lindzen, a uh, professor at MIT, who has contributed, which chapter is it to, to this book? Um, it's chapter 13, Lucky 13. Um, so when he published that paper, he wasn't saying... Um, you know, carbon dioxide is not important. He just said, actually, what's happening in terms of cloud covers, not what's predicted. And maybe there's a negative feedback here that we need to insert into the simulation models. So he was just saying, let's make the current tools a little bit more sophisticated so that we can maybe um, explain or at least incorporate what I can see is happening and what this data proves that in actual fact, as you've got an increase in, um, in temperature, you've got a reduction in um, the amount of high altitude cirrus clouds. So that's all he was suggesting. Rather than actually think about what he was suggesting and why he'd come to this conclusion because the data was overwhelming, they just went, to, to, to ostracise him. Um, research programs were set up to disprove, but, you know, they haven't actually been able to disprove his iris effect. And when, because I really wanted um, Peter Ridd to write about tropical convection, which is mm. linked, um, I really wanted Richard Lindzen to write about the iris effect, and he really didn't want to. He said, Jen, that's only caused me grief and most people don't understand it. And I said, but it's so important. If we're going to move forward, people need to understand um, this theory that, that, that you explained uh, 20 years ago. And so chapter 13. And just some background, I guess, on that is that for those who are not familiar with the debate, the clouds are 60%. They cover 60% of the surface of the planet. And a small change in clouds makes a huge difference. Because clouds are white compared to the very dark ocean, they reflect the sun's rays back out again, especially when they're low clouds. That's the low ones. Yeah, but, but the high clouds are acting in the opposite way. These yeah. high, thin cirrus clouds yeah. are warming. They're helping, they're tiny ice crystals, aren't they, helping to keep the heat in. So clouds can have the opposite effect. Yes. But yeah. a tiny change in clouds either way can yeah. warm or cool. And so, and again, Lindzen's theory was that, and still is, that this small change in these highest level clouds, if you have an increase in these high level clouds, they're going to increase the warming. But if when the planet warms, we get less of them, yep. that's going to cool the planet in response to warming, which helps to keep it all stable. And oh, Lindzen's such Richard a Richard Lindzen said, my theory can't be explained succinctly, but you just did, Joe. You just proved, it's very difficult to prove Richard Lindzen wrong on anything, but you just proved him wrong <laughs> on, on one thing, which is that his iris theory can be explained simply. Yeah. Thank well, you. look, the man's a giant. I, one day, yes, I hope to meet him again. Lucky enough to um, have met him once at a, at a conference in New York, the Heartland Conferences. And again, you know, another example of a free market group doing what I consider to be the best scientific conferences on this topic. And here we have the IPA putting out these great series of books now in the fourth set of books, which have a mix of, of you know, there's something for everyone. It, it, if you're not a scientist, they're, they're, the level that these are written, and there's lots of pictures as well. I was saying to Jen, I'm a very visual girl. I like the, uh, the number of graphs they've got. It, the book is smattered with these wonderful images and, and 
graphs are so important to get your teeth into something, to really understand what's going on. I wish newspapers would use more scientific graphs. It's like they'll put in graphs of bond yields and things, but they just don't put in graphs of ice cores, and ice core data or atmospheric absorption patterns or, you know, and your other favourite graphs from this book, Jen. So, so just talking about graphs, I guess I would really like to thank John Roscombe for giving me a budget and therefore we really <laughs> actually have to thank the people who have donated. And there's a lot of names starting on page 367 of the book to people who made donations to make it possible for the IPA to indulge me with the charts. We had a fellow called John Castles, who is um, a professional illustrator and he worked with me, he worked with the authors um, to make sure that these charts are um, understandable, mm. um, they're colourful, they're exciting. So they're artistic, but they're also technically correct. And it's very difficult to find people like that who can actually, um, yeah, who, who can take, I guess, the chapter author's vision and my vision and communicate that through a chart that can then be reproduced in a book. And John Roskin is very fussy about the quality of the paper, the quality of the charts. Um, and I just thank John um, for giving me the budget uh, to work with John Castles. Mm. And thank you, Joe, for appreciating the charts. I know Roy Spencer, he loved our last book because he said, Jen, it's so difficult nowadays to find books that have got coloured charts that are so technically accurate, um, but also so artistic. And Roy is one of, I mean, we've got a really a pretty much different lineup of authors this time around, but we have got some the same. Roy Spencer was in the last book and he's in this book. Um, brilliant chapter on um, satellite uh, measuring uh, global temperature change with satellites, um, but a little bit of a focus. I asked him to, for a focus on Antarctica, but he also put in the Arctic and he also wanted to talk about sea ice and how it's measured by satellites as well. He is in the book and there is a little bit about him and the awards that he has won in the beginning. The beginning of the book has got a list of the contributors. We've got 20 chapters, we've got 20 authors, and the book's published in 2020. <laughs> so uh, alphabetically, we've got John Abbott, we've got Howard Brady, because I wanted somebody who'd actually been to Antarctica, and Howard Brady's been to Antarctica, and he's written a brilliant sort of overview chapter, that's chapter two. Um, we've got Susan Crockford, of course, who's a polar bear, expert. We've got um, Bella from the Institute of Public Affairs writing about public policy. Um, we've got Arthur Day, a volcanologist. We've got Jeff Duffy, an emeritus professor at the University of Auckland. We've got Scott Hargraves, Ainsley Kello. He's, um, he was head of government at um, which university? University of Tasmania. And Donna Laframboise, she's got a huge mm. following. Um, we've got Richard Lindzen, who we've just been talking about. Paul McFadgen, who's worked for Treasury, brings an economic perspective to funding for climate science. We've got Peter Ridd. And what we missed when we were talking about all those clouds before is how Peter talks about um, the clouds that take the heat from the bottom of the, 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 the surface to the high altitude and we've got one of his clouds on the front of this book. I, but, but I love his analogy, the, the, the heat engine, the idea yeah. that there are a thousand convective storms around the tropics which are like pistons in a car and yeah. for the car geeks in there he's even got a table hasn't he comparing yeah, yeah which parts of the car to the parts in the engine. And I thought that's really going to appeal to the guys who understand how an internal combustion engine works and looking at the way we've got these pistons, these storms effectively working to uh, bring that heat from the surface up to an upper level where it can radiate to space and the importance of these convective cells. So, uh, yeah, I really like that approach. And you can say, well, um, somebody was saying to me, well, why isn't Peter Ridd 
writing about um, Great Barrier Reef. And look, he's written so much about Great Barrier Reef. He wrote about the Great Barrier Reef for our last book. It got him, contributed to him getting sacked. In the next book in the series, I think we'll probably have him back on the Great Barrier Reef. But you know, he's a physicist. He's a physicist, exactly. And he understands the tropics. And Lindzen and Svensmark in their, their chapters, they say, what maybe is missing is how we get this gradient difference between the tropics mm. and the polar regions. And, you know, Peter Ritt and I have been talking about this for so long. <laughs> and I said, Peter, please give me a chapter on that. And he spent a lot of time on it. And Peter Ridd's building on that. But, you know, Peter Ridd has built on the work of Joanne Simpson, and we've dedicated the book to Joanne Simpson. Now, she won a gazillion medals. She was the first female PhD in meteorology anywhere in the world. And this when did going... she get her PhD, Jen? She got her PhD, I think, in 1947. Remarkable. So, yeah. And unfortunately, we lost her in the last so two years. so lauded but... by the mainstream. And she really, so Peter's built on her mathematics, okay? So her work was published from the early 50s through to the 70s. It was tested, retested. Um, there's a theory there. There's the empirical data. And it was just like Lindsay's 2001 paper swept under the carpet because it doesn't give a central role to carbon dioxide. Joanne Simpson's work, such important work, as I said, she won so many medals and everything. So such a, such a, a brilliant meteorologist flying through clouds um, across the tropics, across latitudes, across longitudes, gathering data on the importance of water vapour, on cloud formation, on heat transfer, longitudinally and um, by altitude. And yet um, this work was to some extent forgotten because, yeah, like with Hendrik Svensmark, mm. she doesn't see carbon dioxide as being important. Mm. But Peter Ridd has, I guess, and in this book, to some extent, we are bringing her work um, out um, and, and explaining it. And Peter Ridd builds on her work and he extends it mathematically. Um, so you and, and I guess I feel too we ought to mention, you know, in Peter Ridd's case, how important his work is and yet he has been sacked from James Cook University because he criticised the institutions of science, which you're not allowed to do anymore, and suggests that maybe they need to do more replication of their studies, more meaning retesting the same results to see if they do come up. And for saying this, extraordinarily sacked, which the IPA has been such a huge support to him in running through, we're now up to the High Court case coming sometime next year, just in order for him to keep his job. And that tells us so much about what all scientists at universities in Australia are going to, because which other universities stood up and said, well, hang on a minute, that's not okay. It's not all right for JCU to sack him. It's not all right for them to write into their employee contracts that you can't say what you want that might not be collegial or friendly and you're not allowed to joke in your subject headers, in your emails, because that's not on either. And which university stood up and said, this is not okay? Which university still guards free speech? And the answer is none of them. And I'd like to know when the science minister and the Morrison government might start putting pressure on universities for the $800 million they get to do research to put clauses in their contracts to say, you know what, maybe our academics should be allowed to say what they really think. So Peter's big issue has been quality assurance of the Great Barrier Reef research. And, you know, in discussions of his chapter in this book, he said, you know, the quality assurance and the checking that went into Joanne Simpson's work going back to the 50s and 60s and 70s is just extraordinary. Hmm. But we've lost that. You know, she was developing models, but she was linking it back to the empirical. And that's what Peter, I know, would like to, to see mm. going forward, not just for the Great Barrier Reef, but for atmospheric physics. It's not just about simulation model, it's simulation modeling. It's about checking. Does Richard Lindzen's work with respect to cloud cover and how that changes with temperature, 
Is that accurately reflected in the models? This is, this is what we need to get, mm. to get back to. And so we attempt a little bit of that in this book. And I was talking about authors and I just got to Peter Ridd and we've mm. covered a few different topics there. So Ridd, Peter Ridd and Jim Steele has got the chapter on penguins. Roy Spencer, as I said, Ken Stewart. Um, Ken Stewart's got a chapter in this book about... I really wanted somebody to write something that everybody would be able to understand. You didn't need a PhD um, in atmospheric physics to understand temperatures at Antarctica. And so I got Ken Stewart to write it from, I mean, he just lays things out. He was once a school teacher. He lays it out as a school teacher might. So we've got yeah, and, and I, because I, of course, know Ken because he's yeah. helped us with so much in the terms of auditing the way the Bureau of Met here homogenises data. He's been doing this for like 12 years now and helping me putting up blog posts and whatnot and explaining these issues. And, I mean, all credit to me, unpaid, doing the work that should have been done by the CSIRO, by the universities in Australia, by, you know, even ABC journalists could have got into this. They've got a science unit, a fully paid up science unit. Where's the research they're doing? So, bless Ken him. Lays it really out so simply. He, he lays things out so simply. Mm. There's no pretense. And, and he, he does it because he can. He's got time. And because he cares. Yes, I and think that's the key thing here. Yeah, People yeah. are wrong out there on the internet and we need to fix it. And, yes, Ken's been a soldier. And I really liked his point that Antarctica actually in winter should be the perfect example of where CO2 has some power. Yeah. Just really quickly, Ken is saying it's winter, there's no sunlight coming in, there's very little moisture in the air, the air is very dry because it's so cold. So the effect of CO2 ought to be really obvious. And remember, CO2 is a well-mixed gas in theory. It's rising all over the earth equally. And therefore, we should be able to see that warming effect of CO2 over the Antarctic plate in winter. So he says, let's and we're test not. that. He says, no. let's, let's test it. Yes. So he looks at all the temperatures and on that big plateau, which is in the darkness in winter, we are not seeing a warming effect due to CO2 and we should be. According to the theory. Yes, according to the theory. We uh, should not just be a, seeing a bit. We should I be would, seeing amplified warming. Doubling. I would say it's a fail, failed theory. And I, I think uh, Ken makes the point, okay, this is basic to carbon dioxide driven climate change theory. Let's test it. You can go back and look at Richard Lindzen's chapter 13. And he was doing that 20 years ago, looking at things from a different perspective. And then, yeah, go back to the work in the 60s and 70s about what are the drivers of atmospheric circulation, not carbon dioxide, as um, Peter Ridd explains, building on the work of Joanne Simpson. Just to get to the end in terms of mm. contributors, Henrik Svensmark, um, who is um, a physicist in the Astrophysics and Atmospheric Physics Division at the Danish National Space Institute. He put so much time into his chapter and making sure that we got the illustrations, the charts um, correct. And I'm so looking them. forward to talking to him. In, so you're yes, talking to him as yes we'll be the talking theory. to Heinrich Tensmark, doing an interview with him about his cosmic ray theory. So, yes, I've tried to limit myself from not discussing that this time, so we'll have plenty of time to talk about that in the next interview. Okay. We'll have them coming up. And then, um, so, and then we've got Jaco Vlock, and he has done a lot of work with me on temperatures, and so I asked him to look at the best long temperature records from Antarctica, and he um, talks about particularly the Mawson record. And do you know what the Bureau does? They go and homogenise it against a Russian station. <laughs> so they change a cooling trend in this beautiful long thermometer temperature record from Antarctica into something that gives them a little bit of warming. They can't get statistically significant warming, but they have a go. When I say they, I'm talking about mm. our Australian Bureau of Meteorology. Who, Ain't that who the way? Yes, as, as we saw in the last climate change, um, the, the facts book, the homogenisation of stations. So even in Antarctica, a good station can be polluted with a poor station. They homogenise. The, the Australian Bureau of Meteorology homogenises the temperature data um, from Mawson in Antarctica, even though that station hasn't moved. 
um, though there have been equipment changes and uh, Jaco explains the equipment changes um, that have occurred in Antarctica and he actually explains how the metadata doesn't actually accord with, well, there's data and there's data and the Bureau aren't even up front in terms of why they make the changes because the changes that they make don't actually correspond with the equipment changes. No, of course, it's all black box secret changes. And, you know, unlike publishing full methods, the Bureau, when we, we caught them back in 2016 or 2017, when they finally had to answer questions in front of the Senate, remember, which was partly due to the work of people like Ken Stewart and yourself and myself and others. And the Bureau was forced to admit that they could not explain how they homogenised their temperatures to people who worked outside the bureau because it would take too long. So I've actually had a bit of a go because I couldn't not have a chapter in this book about homogenization. So chapter 16, actually, because since the last Climate Change the Facts book, Climate Change the Facts 2017, of course, we've got ACORN SAT. Um, we've got the new historical reconstruction remodeling so i talk a little bit about that in chapter 16 rewriting australia's temperature history and i know people think that i go on a little bit about rutherglen and there is more on <laughs> rutherglen in this book and i also talk about darwin and of course um people like chris gillam he mm. um explained um, how you get the 23% increase between the, well, the data pre the 2018 and now. And so I talk a little bit about that um, in the chapter in this book and would like to acknowledge, um, uh, I guess, people like Chris Gillam and Ken Stewart, they are so important in terms of... Um, bringing just basic stuff um, to and my again, attention sometimes. Unpaid, with it, no yeah. job, doing it because it's the right thing to do. Because in the end, the truth is really important. I know it's a cliche, but people just, you know, it bugs people. It just We need to figure out how this works and what's going on and getting into that data. And so, yeah, I feel honoured sometimes. So guys like Chris and Ken, and the others in the team who've done such great work to, um, to be able to give them a tiny bit of, of, yes, thanks, gratitude for the hours they spend going through that data to cross-check the BOM, who, by the way, are getting more than a million dollars a day in funds from the taxpayer to give us accurate data and to look at our historic weather collected across hundreds of stations around the country since 1850, though, the first kind of 1851 or something, the first, very first um, data starts to come in. And it, it is, it's a travesty what they've done with it. So they're just obsessed with remodelling the data, as I explain in... To fit the models. To fit the models, as I, as I explain in, in Chapter Chapter 16, we've got a chapter on sea level change. That's chapter 17. Um, and Scott Hargraves, um, chapter 20, mm. the last chapter in the book, it's called A Descent into Skeptics' Hell. And it's a little bit philosophical and it does sort of, I think, a little bit explain what it's like being a skeptic and how just following the data and, you know, asking... There's a great diagram there of Dante's, the, <laughs> Dante's layers, the descent yeah. into hell and, and related to the sceptic debate. And, and then how the yeah. sceptics at different layers and, um, and, and he sort of categorises, he sort of talks about... Because I know Bjorn Lomborg, he wrote for our last book, but Bjorn always says, Jen... You know, if you start querying the official statistics, you're sort of getting into the realm of what could be considered conspiratorial. And I always say to Bjorn, I don't care about the conspiracy theories. I just want to know what the data says. I desperately want to know what the data says. And if the data takes me in that particular direction, even if you think we shouldn't be asking the questions or some people say we shouldn't be asking the questions because it might sound conspiratorial. You know what? I don't care. I just say, 
follow the data, just be honest to the data and, 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 and go with it and trust that we'll come out the other end. You know, I, I love what Lomborg does with the economics and he's been such a gem putting toward those economic arguments forwards. But yes, this idea that scientists are supposed to obey the consensus just because it's there is totally the antithesis of what science is. And what, he, what, what Lomborg says, so I, I, I probably need to explain this a little bit more, is he just says to me, Jen, if you're going to question the official data, you need to be really careful and you need to be really sure. And I always say to him, I am careful and I yes. am sure. And I guess in Chapter 20 of the book, what Scott Hargraves has explained is that it is true once you do start querying the data at different levels, you can really be ostracized you can end Absolutely. up fact. it happens yes. to peter red um but look at Lombok himself uh, i mean it's a case of not feeding the crocodile he was ostracized too given yes. by tony abbott money to set up a four million dollar institute at uwa and even four million dollars is not enough to buy you protection from the mob at universities in australia and i was out there defending there him is no and protection. hoping that he would get that center and yet in the end you know no chance that that they would allow that to happen at any university in Australia, which tells you why it's so important to get books like this out and to provide a spot for voices who have been chucked out of the system like Peter Ridd in order that we don't lose that expertise because it's tough enough being at a uni being Mr Unpopular, but when you're outside the uni and you have none of that support network, it becomes even harder. There's, there's no protection. But, but, but there's no protection from the politics. But I think what sustains people like Peter, what sustains um, you and me, is being able to feel that we're getting a bit closer to the truth by the being sense honest of discovery. with the data. What's that? The sense of discovery, that thrill of, of finding a connection that someone may not have found before. Yes, yeah. even I like to Google it and hope that I can put two things in an entry that no one else has done before and <laughs> we kid ourselves, we might find a connection that no one's seen. And, yeah, and look, and I remember talking about Mark Stein introducing him at an IPA event in Perth, which is probably a great note to finish on to everyone listening out there. They, uh, scientists run on the thrill of discovery, but they also run on the, the recognition that sending those emails just to say thank you, that's using their name, that quoting them, citing them in comments on, you know, on the book. email chains, buy the book, train yourself up on ways to, you know, use their names and what they're doing and the work they're doing because that keeps them going too. And, and, and I remember Mark Stein was quite struck by that in the introduction because I said the guys on the front line can't show weakness. This is part of the debate, the fact that it is so much about bullying and it's about, you know, images. And the guys on the front line will not show signs of weakness and they won't ask for it, but they're human and they need support. And we've got to remember to give support to those people on the front line because it is so tough. And when you've pushed out of institutions like Peter Ritt has been and you're cut off from all of the benefits that go with that and the recognition that goes with that and the funding that goes with that, everything, life can just become really difficult. And that is one of the ways they have kept this science at bay and pushed down for 30 years now since the IPCC was formed. And that's why this book is so important. And Jen, I think we've gone way over time and we could keep talking for hours on this, obviously, but we perhaps better call it a day there and just say, buy the book, have a look at the, uh, at the wonderful different opinions and the great graphs and data and the, just the, the gripping discovery of this planet. Thanks, Joe, for letting me talk about, yeah, so much that is in, in this important book. Um, thank you so much, Joe. I hope you enjoyed that interview and I hope it has inspired you to pick up a copy of Climate Change The Facts 2020. I cannot recommend the book enough. To watch the interviews in the series or to find out more about the book or to purchase a copy, head over to climatechangethefacts.org.au.